Schools teach us a lot of things, subjects such as reading, writing, math, and science, as well as skills like critical thinking and how to work in groups. However, our schools fail to teach us one of the most important skills we need to know to be successful adults, how to manage finances. Hello, my name is Anna Oldham, and you're listening to the first ever podcast from Anastasia Productions. Today, we're going to talk about financial literacy classes in schools, why we need them, how they can be helpful, and why we don't already have them in the curriculum. One would think that America, which sports the largest economy in the world, would do a good job in making sure that its citizens were financially literate. However, if you look at the amount of debt, unpaid bills, and lack of budgeting and saving in the U.S., you'd realize very quickly that something is very wrong. I'd like to throw some stati- some statistics at you from the 2019 Consumer Financial Literacy Survey and from the Personal Finance Statistics 2019 blog, which compiles financial literacy statistics from other government surveys. I've also brought in some statistics from Grant Eckert's article about financial education in schools, which I will address more thoroughly in a moment. While America has the largest economy, we rank 14th in financial literacy. In 2019, the total consumer debt amounted to nearly four trillion, four trillion, with an average household debt of $137,063. 61% of Americans struggle with credit card debt. That's over half the US population and two out of five Americans carry that debt month to month. Only two out of five, 41% of people keep and follow a budget. Only 40% spend less than they earn, and 25% of people don't pay their bills on time. Only seven out of 10 people have a non-retirement savings account, and of those people, 58 have less than $1,000 in savings. 21% of Americans don't have retirement savings at all, and less than 20% of those who do say they feel confident their retirement savings will be enough. We are looking at a country where a majority of the population is struggling with debt, doesn't manage their expenses, doesn't have sufficient savings to get them through an emergency, and doesn't feel like they will have enough funds to retire. And college students, like myself, have another set of statistics to worry about. The national student loan debt is $1.5 trillion, with an average student loan debt of $32,741. Students who haven't even entered the workforce yet will be carrying this burden on their shoulders. And it is only going to get worse, considering that the cost of college is growing eight times faster than incomes are growing. How are students supposed to be able to graduate with their degree and lead successful lives under this debt if they don't have the financial literacy to manage their own expenses? I would like to bring to you three studies regarding financial literacy. The first study, performed by Karen Sproul Fort in 2012, looked at the effects of a financial literacy class given to Latino women through a social, socio-cultural perspective. The second study, by Darren Henry, Sylvia McCormack, and Nauman Zaid in 2015, looked at the effectiveness of a simulation-based learning activity in a third-year finance class. The third study, performed by Catherine Reach and Jeffrey Berman in 2015, examined the overall effectiveness of a financial literacy class for students based on their financial knowledge and positive and negative financial behaviors. Some people question whether financial literacy classes are effective and argue that if the classes aren't as effective as promised, they should be removed from the curriculum. Today, I'm here to tell you that not only are these financial literacy classes effective, but they are crucial in helping remediate the debt and financial confusion 
so many Americans face. In all three studies, the financial literacy class was shown to have a real and positive effect on students' financial lifestyle. In the first study, individuals were able to increase their savings to 10% of their income. The average credit score was increased by 19 points. There was a decrease in debt, and some opened a savings account for the first time. In the second study, students learned how to better judge the value of an item or good and were able to better negotiate the sale and purchase of said item or good. In the third study, students scored higher on a financial knowledge test than the control group, showed more positive financial behaviors like depositing and leaving money in a savings account, and fewer negative behaviors like overdrawing an account. Additionally, I would argue that any improvement to a student's financial literacy, no matter how small, warrants keeping literacy classes in schools. Some improvement is better than no improvement, especially seeing as how in the third study, researchers found that the financial knowledge test scores of the control group was equal to the score for chance level guessing which means if you attached a pencil to a chicken and let the chicken peck at the test sheet, that chicken would get as many correct answers as the people in that control group. And that's scary. It truly is. These are the people who are going out into the world, getting student loans, getting a house, getting a job, and then have to know how to manage those loans, those bills, those taxes, and we expect them to do this without getting caught in the trap of debt. We expect these people with little to no understanding about how to manage their finances to magically figure out how to spend, save, and budget their lives when they never learned those things in school to begin with. The traditional view of school is that the purpose of schools is to prepare children to function in their society by passing down core pieces of societal knowledge deemed necessary for anyone to learn. This is the origin of the seven core subjects, under the assumption that mastery of these subjects will allow students to integrate into the societal system once they graduate. Money is the lifeblood of society. It's how you do everything. To get food, water, and shelter, you need money. Jobs don't pay people in cows or timber, they pay with money. So why then, if the purpose of schools is to prepare children to function in society, do schools not teach them about the most fundamental part of society? What use are core subjects if financial literacy, the most important subject any adult should have knowledge in, isn't among them? As it turns out, the issue may be less about opposition to financial literacy classes than it is about schools not being able to find the inertia to get them going. Grant Eckert from the National Debt Relief and Dan Cadlick from Time find that today only 17 U.S. states require students to learn about personal finance, and only four of those states require it to be taught as a separate course. Both authors point to standardized testing as one of the largest reasons personal finance has been pushed into the background. Because financial literacy isn't tested on standardized tests like the ACT or SAT, it's seen as an extracurricular and isn't prioritized in the curriculum. As Kedlick points out, if it's not tested, it's not taught. Because there's no federal authority that can mandate that financial literacy be taught in schools, it would be up to the schools themselves to decide to teach the class. And even if schools did decide to bring financial literacy into the standardized testing, teaching it wouldn't be easy. Not only do a lot of teachers feel reluctant and unqualified to teach personal finance, but there's also disagreement about what kind of instruction would work best. Without a clear idea of how to teach personal finance and without teachers to teach it, financial literacy classes will remain absent from schools. Yet there is hope. Thanks to research like the ones discussed here, we may have a better insight as to what kind of teaching style is most effective. 
I'd like to introduce you to the progressive system of schooling. Where traditional schooling believes in a strict core knowledge standard that everyone must know and believes that all students must learn at the same pace and in the same way, the progressive model says, no, that's not how things work and that's not how people learn. Instead of simply regurgitating facts, the progressive model looks at how students can interact with the course material, how each student learns differently, and how each and how the student-teacher dynamic strongly influences a student's ability and willingness to learn. In Ford's research with Latino women, not only did the teacher teach the basic principles of personal finance, but they brought in the personal experience and stories of the women and discussed in depth how finance was deeply connected to Latino, white Anglo, and machismo culture. They extended what they were learning in the classroom into society, and it worked. Not only did these women learn basic facts, but they were able to understand and apply it in their own lives to see real behavior changes. These women weren't trying to pass a test on financial literacy, they were actually saving money and setting goals. Compare this to Reach and Berman's research where the class was taught in a more traditional sense with an emphasis on passing a financial literacy test. While everyone in the financial literacy class scored higher than on, on that test than the control group, and students that had started out the class with lots of, of positive financial behaviors showed an increase in those behaviors, the students who didn't already practice a lot of positive financial behaviors didn't change those behaviors. And it's not because those students didn't learn anything, because those same students scored the highest on the test. They didn't change their behaviors because the class failed to acknowledge the background and different experiences the students had. It gave them all the facts they needed to ace the test without giving them any ability to apply it in the real world. So this is what I propose. We need financial education in schools, and we need it everywhere. One of the best ways we could do this is to recognize that financial literacy is crucial to integrating into society and recognize it as another core curriculum. That would succeed in bringing it back into the spotlight. We also need to train teachers so that they feel like they are qualified to teach this class. Then we need to find a way to make the progressive class structure fit inside the expectations of a traditional model so that a progressive class is able to measure success like, tr like the traditional model wants without relying on a rigid textbook or exam. That might mean that a teacher has a list of topics they need to discuss, but it's up to them to decide how to go about discussing those topics. That might also mean that each financial literacy class is taught differently, depending on the students in the classroom. And that's okay, because at the end of the day, these students are learning how to manage their finances, how to stay out of debt, and how to function in society. That goal is the reason why we need financial literacy in schools.